Hey guys, Sean here and welcome to the F1 Word podcast episode number two. I'm joined by John T for this week's podcast. We're going to be talking about our memories of Imola 1994, one of, if not the darkest weekend in Formula 1 history. I remember it like it was yesterday, John T, eight years old, I think I was, yet it still feels like yesterday. Yeah, I mean, I was 14 years old. It's a little bit easier for me to remember, but it was just horrible. All weekend, there was just something wasn't right. I hate using the term, but it, it did feel like the whole weekend was cursed, didn't it? We had Barrichello's crash on the Friday, which it's a miracle he got out of alive. But just the whole weekend, it just, you're right, it, it didn't feel right. I, I just, I hate the word cursed, like I say, but that's kind of the only way to describe it almost. Yeah, that really is the way it felt. Like you say, from the Friday, Barrichello's crash coming through Variante Bassa was just insane. Launching off the curbs, and clipping the top of the tyres and rolling in a horrible way. It was not something I've really seen that close before. It's it's a tough watch even now, isn't it? When you look back at some of the incidents from that weekend, but that one for Barrichello is such a loved driver as well. It just horrific crash. Like you said, it's just something I'd never seen that before. I I think I got it on the news because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't it BBC Sport that did it? And you only really got qualifying in the races live, didn't you? Yeah, that was it. Uh, it was six o'clock news when I saw it, uh, having my tea and seeing not just the crash itself, but the the lack of understanding that was in the marshals about the medical side at the time, even though it was 1994, it's not that long ago, I've seen them roll the car over and the way his head bounces backwards and forwards. It was just, it was cringing. Yeah, the, the idea that, you know, you look at all the safety now and they've got lights on the cars that say, don't move this driver after a certain impact and all these safety precautions we've got. But back then it was just get him out of the car, wasn't it? That was how it was. Yeah, because obviously back then there was a lot more worry about fire. Absolutely. And like you say, when they turn the car over and the head's moving, it, it just, like you say, it was the news where I saw it. So I don't know whether that made it feel worse in a way, because as a kid, when you see the news, you instantly think the worst for something like that. Whereas if you watched it on TV now, you'd have a lot more information. People be going, oh, he's moving or you're getting this or you're getting that. But at the time, you just it just felt really bad. And then obviously you roll on into, was it Saturday qualifying Ratzenberger, who, by the way, is a guy that I think gets forgotten, gets forgotten all too often for this weekend. I, I think he gets forgotten a lot. But that crash, oh, that I can remember seeing that on the news. A horrific crash, every single bit of that. And that, as an eight-year-old, I can remember that's almost, it's devastating, heartbreaking. You just don't ever think you're going to see that on TV at eight years old. No, I mean, it shows a difference in almost uh, social re responsibility of the media then, because they weren't afraid to show these things on the news. Now, whether that's for good or for ill, it's a different topic for discussion, but they did show it six o'clock in the evening and we saw it, actually watched it live. I think it was BBC Two at the time, not BBC One. Seeing the car just grind to a halt and being able to see him through the car itself with the hole in the monocoque was just, I mean, it was bad for me. I'd already come to terms with things like that, but seeing it just from a sport was just something completely different. You don't expect to see it, do you? Like you say, from a sport, I just never expected that. If you see a war-torn country or something on the news, it's it's sad enough, but especially a sport that you you love so much as well, to see that happen. And like I said, do you, do you feel Ratzenberger gets forgotten a lot at this time of year? I just It's just a feeling I have sometimes on social media. Uh, yeah, he really does. There's been, uh, with the recent change in social media towards Formula 1, there's been some effort to make sure that younger people are aware that Ratzenberger was there and not just Senna, which yeah. I think is good. But he still does get forgotten all too much. And the, the big thing of that is he was actually a very good driver. He had a future. He did. He was, he was quite highly tipped, wasn't he? I seem to remember um, not hype around him in the same way we get now, but people were talking about him quite a lot before he came into the sport. And he just seemed like a really nice guy. I mean, I've obviously seen the Senna movie as well. You get to see a lot more of what happened that weekend and you, you hear a lot more about him. But... The whole thing, I mean, nobody ever deserves to die doing what they love. And I know that we have big arguments about safety all the time on the channel, you know, and people get involved all the time and that's great. But when you go back and you watch 1994, that's bad. And it's horrible to watch, even like in the Senna movie. And you think, oh, wow, this is, this is really deep. This is dark. Witnessing it, albeit only on TV, is a whole different package of emotions, isn't it? it if you understand what I'm saying, not trying to go to A-level psychology with it, but that's kind of how it feels. Yeah, it just, it makes it more real. Even, even as an adult, when you see some things on TV, it, you understand that it's bad, but you just don't accept that it's real. 
with the fact that this was someone who was effectively immortal to all his fans, as far as Senna goes. It was, you don't, you just don't ever think you'll see it. And that that closeness by being fans of these people, seeing them on on the podiums for many races, it has a human element that it just hits home a lot harder. I think that's a, a great point. The the immortal word there, I think, kind of sums it up, doesn't it? I mean, you look at it doesn't even have to be a legend of the sport. You know, I I fell into a little bit off topic in a way, I suppose, but I fell into that trap a few years back before Bianchi's incident where I thought, nah, we'll, we'll never see it again now. The, the sport's plenty safe enough. And obviously that's that's not true. But back in 1994, before Imola, that was very much the attitude as well, wasn't it? Like, you know, this this won't happen again. The sport's getting safe. We're taking all these measures. It's almost like fate, if you like. Again, something else I don't like to refer to too much, but fate kind of gave everyone a wake-up call and probably in one of the most horrific ways it possibly could. Yeah, it proved that it can happen to anyone. Um, it does, uh, you do actually raise a little point there, which I find to be a sore point, because everyone goes on saying, oh, it was the first time we'd seen a death in Formula 1 for 12 years. Everyone seems to forget about uh, Elio De Angelis, who was killed during testing. So it's unfair that he gets forgotten. And there's a lot of people who get forgotten through things like that, which is you know, the marshals. Several marshals have been killed or severely injured, and they don't get remembered. I think it's probably a little sore point about that whole weekend and ties into the fact that you're saying that Roland Barzenberger keeps getting forgotten too much. Yeah, it's a great point because before we get too much onto Senna, there were other incidents that weekend. But was it nine injured in the crowd after the accident between uh, Lamy and Leto, was it? Off the start yeah. line, the nine injured in the crowd because of fl- I mean, that in itself was a horrific incident. That's horrible. Again, amazing. They walked, well, didn't walk away from that. Obviously, there were injuries, but you know that doesn't get mentioned enough. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, Leto stall, Lamy ploughed into the back of him when he had no time to react, and one of the wheels went over the fence, and it hit eight members of the public and a police officer, who all had to be treated for injuries, and Leto himself needed some treatment for injuries. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. That was such a huge impact off the line. It, it's an easy error, isn't it? it? It sounds so obvious to say, but he's, he's blindsided. It's just the sort of thing that just the image in my head that accident is bad enough you know and you think about Barrichello's accident Ratzenberger's accident how that could have been another two that weekend very easily with that impact and then there's a nine in the crowd as well you know it's a scary thought as to where Imola could have gone and that's not to say it wasn't bad enough but I think you know what I mean just yeah I mean and it didn't even stop there all stop after Senna's accident because towards the end of the race in a pit stop you had driver a driver whose name is escaping me right now is it Michele Alboreto um if it's a one I think you thought I think it was Alboreto yeah yeah in the pit lane his wheel wasn't on problem wasn't on properly and came off and hit three Ferrari mechan- mechanics and a Minardi mechanic I think one of which needed hospital treatment I think it does come back to that weekend it was just it, you were, the word you choose is right it was cursed some nothing was ever gonna get through that weekend without something bad happening Today is obviously, when this podcast goes up, is the day of, of Ayrton Senna's death, the day that accident that is, again, I hate the word, but kind of the most, if you like, famous moment of the weekend, the thing that people remember the most, the the impact. I mean, when I was watching that as a kid, obviously, I'd seen the stuff about Ratzenberger on the news, and I'd seen Barrichello's accident, and but that one for me, it almost woke me up. I go back to what you were saying about, you know... Um, your icons, your your heroes being indestructible effectively. It's kind of how I felt to that point, despite seeing Ratzenberger. Um, and to see that with Senna, you, you almost, from what we saw on TV, I know they cut, a, cut away a lot and we didn't see everything that we saw in the film, but just seeing his car with him in it and seeing there's no movement, just, just lifeless in there. As an eight-year-old, it's quite haunting. And I'm not going to sit here and say I still suffer from it or anything stupid like that, but thinking back, you know, versus watching it on a DVD, it's quite a, a slap at eight years old. And I'd imagine, John, I know you're a little bit older, but at 14, it's probably quite a similar feeling. It was exactly the same feeling. Although the difference was that um, one of our neighbours had a Sky very early on. So as I was watching it, the BBC footage cut away. They wouldn't show any of it. It was just a few talking in the pit lane. I can't remember who was hosting the show. But, um, my dad actually ran down to the neighbours because they had early Sky and Eurosport when it was completely independent channel. Um, and they had their own cameras there. So you knew what was going on and sort of kept relaying information. And there was just, there was no news. And the bit that really bothered me was 
just after the crash as the rescue crews are first getting there. I don't know if it's some kind of nervous reflex action or some energy just leaving his helmet from how he's sitting or what have you, but his head moves. And that filled everyone with so much hope. And I always remember that bit. Everyone was like, oh, a big sigh of relief. And then it came to nothing, which was re- that was hard to handle. Obviously, yeah. I, I know that the moment I've seen that in the film, um, like I said, the BBC didn't show all of it. Um, but I can't even sat with, I, I seem to, I'm sure it's my dad. I'm sure it's my mum and dad. It might've been my, my granddad, but I'm not sure. He was the one that got me into F1 in the first place. So could have been him, but sat with family. And I I knew something wasn't right. You, you could see that from the way the TV was, the TV broadcast was going. They weren't showing anything more of it. And you thought, this isn't right. If that was a crash and he got up and walked away or even had just gone off on a stretcher, they'd have shown something by now or given you an update. And it wasn't until, I'm sure it was my mum, just said, literally just said, oh no, like that. And that's when I was sure that was it, you know, before I'd seen the news. And like you say, it's so different to how we are now. There, w- there was no news, was there? If, if you're watching Twitter now during a race and something big happens, you've got an update within 10 minutes. And it wasn't until, it wasn't confirmed until... I might be wrong. I think it was again the six o'clock news before it was confirmed, or I seem to recall. I can remember it vividly at four minutes past six. Um, not on the TV, so I wasn't watching the TV. Um, what most people, younger viewers who have only just recently got into it won't understand is that the radio was a much more reliable source of information at this time. Yeah. So I, I went into my bedroom after the race had finished, and I was just sat listening to the radio for two and a half hours. And, and this is a point, another point about the weekend that people who weren't there won't get. We really didn't know. Well, all the things you'll read, the articles on the internet, things like Wikipedia and motorsport.com, all these places, when they write a story about it, because of Italian law, the official time of death is the moment of impact of the war, which was, what, 215, 217, something like that? Yeah. Whereas in reality, we didn't officially hear that he died until four hours after that such a long time to just sit wondering and that's just as fan young fans i can't imagine what people close to him must have been thinking it's just doesn't bear thinking about does it you know like you say as a a young fan you're sat and you're waiting and it's hard for you but you know if you're his mum his dad any family that's that's horrific and obviously they're going to know before we would obviously but you're right on the radio definitely more reliable source i i waited until it came on the news or until the news updated on what was going on. But even then, despite knowing something was wrong, I fully expected the news to come out and say he's alive. He's just in a critical condition. I didn't expect to hear he's dead. No, never expected it in a million years, but suspected it. Yeah. With the way the TV had behaved. I mean, I'd seen some horrific crashes, Martin Donnelly in particular, and but they'd always seemed less. They despite the drama and spectacularness of the crash, the drivers always seemed like they were going to be fine. Even when they were stretched away, they'd be waving. Even a couple of minutes after, people were saying, yeah, he's conscious, blah, blah, blah. But there was none of that. That's what made it so eerie. I think the drivers' reactions as well at the second start, um, or the restart, if you like, I think that was something altogether different, wasn't it? And obviously, end of the race as well. You know, Schumacher not taking any joy in it, no champagne, no celebrations. Yeah, actually, when you think back, it was kind of, you don't you don't know at that age, but when you think back and you look back at what you remember, it was it was kind of obvious that what was going on, wasn't it? But, you know, I, rem- I remember Damon Hill, it might be from the film, actually, rather than from a memory, but I can remember Damon Hill sat at the side of the track waiting for the restart and he just looked gone, as if he knew at that point what had happened and that, you know, they'd lost him and... That's a, that's a tough one for him as, as Senna's teammate as well, isn't it? And will always be Senna's last teammate is getting back in that car, knowing that Senna's had a crash that is either close to fatal or, or is fatal. And then getting in a car, not knowing what went wrong. That's quite a big thing to do as well. Yeah, that would be very brave of him. And again, someone else who gets forgotten a lot, David Brabham in the other Simtech car. Of course, yeah. Sorry, that's me they, going back on the Rasenberger thing. Yeah, well, they, they chose to race on which I think is fair because every race driver likes to think that's how they would want their team to react if it happened to them. It's all about the race. So don't just give up because of that. And they don't get enough credit for that. But like you say, he'll get waiting for the restart, not knowing what happened, not knowing if his teammates are alive or not, and having to get into the exact same car, wondering 
could this happen to me? I just, like you say, as a racing driver, they kind of, not you expect them to get back in the car, but it's it's not a surprise when they do. But you think day-to-day life, I know it's a completely different thing, but you'd never jump straight back into something like that, would you? You'd, you'd want, I don't know. I mean, you're right about, about Ratzenberger's teammate. And there was a great, I don't know if you saw it, a great documentary on Sky a few years ago. I think it was called The Last Teammate and it was Hill and Brabham, I think. And that was that was quite a nice thing to watch as well. Quite, it was great to get their perspective of why they did what they did over the weekend and why they got back in the car. So, if you've not seen it, definitely worth a watch. But I'm sure you have, John. So. Yeah, I have seen that one. It actually, seemed quite difficult for Hill to make. Yeah, I'd I'd agree with that. I, on the subject of difficult decisions as well, Senna so nearly talked out of going racing, wasn't he, by Sid Watkins and and I think Gerhard Berger tried to convince him. I might be wrong on that, but I know Sid Watkins. It's in the film as well, isn't it? it said you know, let's let's retire together and go fishing. And Senna was like, no, I've, I've got to race. Yeah, it was. Um, Sid Watkins actually found Senna curled up in a ball crying in his motorhome um, after Ratzenberg's accident, which was, that's just, that's impossible to imagine someone like him crying like a child. But Sid Watkins said, look, you've, you've done everything. You've got three world titles. Everyone knows you're the fastest. You've got nothing else to prove. Come on, let's go fishing. Even with someone telling you that to still say, no, I've got to race. I'm, we will never understand that mentality, I don't think. That's very much who he was, though, wasn't it? You know, kind of, I'm a racing driver, that is who I am, and that is all I am, which in some ways, in fact, in many ways, I think it's quite admirable to, to know who you are and what you want to do. But, you know, we're looking at it from hindsight. You know, it sounds ridiculous. You know, you think, why are you getting in the car? What are you doing? But we've seen it so many times throughout F1 history. Drivers continue to race, sometimes despite the fact accidents are still ongoing and people are still dying at the side of the road. That is just kind of, is it wrong to say it's ingrained in them? Uh, no, it's who they are. It's all about the race. It's all about the win. I know it sounds really cheesy and stupid to quote a movie like Fast and Furious, but to these guys, that line's right. It doesn't matter if you win by an inch or a mile. Wins in, winning's winning. That is all that matters to these guys. It's just amazing. Like I say, when you think about it, you I don't know. You're right. We'll never know what goes on in their heads because we're not racing drivers and we never know why they make the decisions they do. But it's so hard looking back. Um, and, and to remember it so vividly as well is quite unusual. I've, I've usually got the memory of a goldfish, quite frankly. But for some reason that stuck with me. And, and it's actually quite a similar thing with, with the Bianchi one. I remember that very recently as well. But that's, what, four years ago now? And I don't know if it's just something that as an F1 fan is always going to stay with you or whether it's just a personal thing. I don't know. but that weekend, it's always going to be somewhere in my mind when I talk about F1, even if it's nothing related to it. Yeah, it is one of them. It, I think it's right to call it the darkest weekend in Formula 1, even though there have been more than one driver killed that weekend previously. It was just the whole air surrounding it. And not just that weekend, that whole year, in some ways, just had a negativity. I don't know if the later part of the year was made that way because of San Marino, but there were multiple other incidents throughout the year. You know, Venmiga had a horrible crash in Monaco. There was an incident in Japan where Brundle broke a marshal's leg because there was poor signaling, poor um, weather conditions. And even before San Marino, drivers were missing races because they were breaking arms and tests and all sorts. That There was just something really bad. It was as if it was sort of a, a line between speed and safety and they just crept over the line into speed and left the safety behind so something was bound to happen it was just the feeling of the whole season i was just going to say actually um interesting to say the line thing for me maybe it's just me maybe it's something i don't know if you feel the same but like it felt to me and still does now like that was just over the line and that was the sport saying right You've had your fun. That needs to be the past now. You've got to sort this out. You've got to move. Like the turning point of Formula One almost, which frankly should have come 30 years earlier, but it just, it felt like a turning point in the sport towards safety and that that was not going to be acceptable. And obviously we saw things in the past on TV, Roger Williamson's crash, which I think in a documentary I saw, I think it was the Grand Prix, the killer years that BBC did. They said that it shamed the sport to its core. And they didn't learn enough from that. They learned, but not enough. And then technology continued to move on and the sport didn't sort its safety out. And then we got to him in the 94 and it kind of shamed its sport, shamed the sport to its core again, all over again. And it just felt like a real turning point and, and rightly so, but it's just so sad and tragic that it had to take, it has to take things like that for the sport to change and to move forward. And 
yeah, that's just, I don't know. Did it feel like a turning point for you, John T? Yes, definitely. And it was the Saturday with Ratzenberger that was the turning point. The anger of some of the drivers of, because of the fact this could happen. Um, Senna, Berger and Schumacher and someone else, I can't remember who, um, actually met for hours and reformed the Grand Prix Drivers Association there and then to improve driver safety. It's just a shame that Senna didn't get to see it through. And so much changed after that as well in 94, didn't it? You know, false chicanes put in places and corners slowed down and so many changes came in that uh, I suppose it's quite a strange one because without Imola 94, would be would we be where we are now with safety? Um, it's quite a popular question actually on streams, isn't it? Some people will ask that, but my answer to that is always, if that hadn't have happened then, it would have happened eventually, wouldn't it? So um we might have been a year but a year or two behind, but it was inevitable something like that was going to happen. Like you said, the speed of the cars in 94 was insane. And actually, weirdly, going back to what you were saying about drivers breaking arms, I remember owning the um, the review VHS, uh, to go back and make us sound even older, John, but the VHS of the, the 94 review. And before every race, it was, Eddie Irvine will miss this race because of a broken this. And, so, and it's so... If that were happening Too now, often. yeah, if that were happening now, if we had, say, before this weekend, Hamilton's broken his arm and then the next weekend, Vettel's broken his leg, there'd be changes pretty much instantly, wouldn't there? Well, we like to think so. Whether there would or not, um, hopefully doesn't remain to be seen. But yeah, you know the point I'm making, because ultimately, Senna's accident death was avoidable, as we've discussed a few times. Um, now, I've checked the date. It was... 89 that Berger had his accident, <laughs> not 93 <Yeah. laughs> as we keep thinking. Same corner, pretty much the same place, roughly the same speed, virtually an identical crash. And Berger was very lucky to get out of it because his car erupted into flames. This goes to the point of the FIA never learning from their mistakes quick enough. It's the f- it was the fastest corner in all of Formula One at that time, even faster than Blanchim on a 130R. There should be tyres in front of the concrete. That is all that was needed to save them. Nothing else. Everyone, there's so many different things about Williams did this, Williams did that, this broke, that broke, such and such is to blame, this other person's to blame, why was the inquest sort of slightly dodgy? None of that matters. Two layers of rubber. That's what matters. Absolutely. It's so, it's such a fundamental thing as well, isn't it, that we expect nowadays, you know, they just didn't do that though. You look at Johnny Herbert's accident, again, another one who, was so lucky to to get away from that one. But although it was an unusual place to have a crash, there were no tyres, there was no real safety in that area. And that's, it just feels like that era, almost, I guess, going back to Zandvoort and Roger Williamson's accident and the whole oh, Titanic analogy, I know, but unsinkable. That whole week, oh, we've got all this safety at Zandvoort and nothing could go wrong here. This is an unsinkable race, no problem. Driver burns to death on the side of the road, on the side of the racetrack. And then, you get to Imola and, and leading up to that, there's still that vibe around it. Like you say with Gerhard Berger, five years before the accident, nothing done, kind of like, oh, it won't happen again. We've sorted the fuel tank out. Well, no, it's, you, you can't ever think that this sport is safe enough, which is why you look at things like the halo and as disgusting as it is to look at, if that saves a life, it's justified. And safety has to keep evolving in the sport is, is kind of what I'm saying. And we do seem to get tricked into a false sense of, of security with it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned the halo, and yes, it's unpleasant to look at, and people do keep going on about it, but let it go. You're stuck with it. And But they use the arguments of, well, it won't stop small things. I'm like, no, probably not, but it'll stop the big things. And whilst it's stopping big things, they're working on better solutions that will also stop small things. You know, it's constantly evolving. This isn't how it all ends. Safety is constantly evolving and will continue to do so, hopefully to make sure no one else ever dies in a car. The, the sad fact is Formula One, I think, or maybe not fact, fact is maybe a little bit defeatist in, in the world, I don't know, but there will be another, there'll be another accident, there will be another serious injury or fatality, it's kind of, it is it is inevitable that, you know, these guys are doing 200 miles an hour plus, aren't they, and we saw at the weekend, without dragging modern day F1 into it too much, but Bottas's puncture, that goes another way, it's a huge accident, and you just don't know, you just never know, and I, I just, I never am ever going to feel like having been, once again, saying it, sort of tricked into that false sense of security before Bianchi's death, I'll never, I'll always make sure that I never fall back into that trap again. Yeah, you mentioned Bianchi. I've looked at that in from every possible angle, taken all the arguments that people have had and every argument's right and every argument's wrong. It's one of those things that you just can't plan for. 
people say, oh, it was because the tractor was on track. Yeah, absolutely. But if there was a crane outside the track, you still need the marshals where the car was to have guide wires on it so it's not flapping around everywhere. So that's two or three marshals getting hit with the car instead of the tractor. Whose life's more valuable, the driver or the marshals? That's not an answerable question. No. They need to stop planning for the impossible things which will happen from time to time and just planning on the things we know we can stop because the freak things will always happen no matter what you do. That's that's exactly it. You can only make the sport so safe, can't you? And there's always going to be something. And that's kind of, yeah, quite quite a morbid. I know it's quite a morbid podcast anyway, but quite a morbid note to, to go to on that. But it's you're right, you can, only, you can only improve safety so far. But going back to 1994, I mean, that whole weekend, we've said it a few times, cursed the darkest weekend in Formula One history and shame the sport. What's your, it's a hard question to ask, but what's your kind of lasting memory from that weekend that sort of stands out to you the most? Being upset, really, just about that. I was a kid still, and it didn't need to happen. That's, yeah, that's exactly what I remember. Like I say, my parents watching it with them and seeing their reaction and reacting to them. I guess you do at eight, don't you? I suppose at that age, you do react to your parents a lot more and just everything around it and upsets the word. I, I was devastated that the idea that such an idol could be killed at something that is supposed to be a sport and something that you are enjoying watching, it cha- it changes your perception of the sport. It's kind of how you felt about it. It completely changed my perception of how Formula One was. Oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't watch the race that came after. I can't remember what race it was. Um, I just didn't have the heart to. I was like, no, I don't want to watch this. That could happen again. I mean, I got over that, but that's how it felt. Seeing all those other drivers as well and their reaction, isn't it? I think it was it Monaco afterwards. I seem to think it might be. It's about the right time of year, well, isn't it? So Yes, it was because I can remember the flags painted, painted in uh, grid slots one and two. Yeah. Fateful irony, I guess, that the next race was probably one he would have won i know he was on on for the win in imola but monaco was his track wasn't it very much his track oh yeah absolutely in fact going just going back a point the lasting memory is learning about the flag that was stuffed in his cockpit you know, if you remember, yeah it, it turned out after everything was being cleared away he'd have got an austrian flag in his cockpit that he planned to fly at the end of the race that's quite a a poignant note isn't it that's tells you everything about him as a person yeah. as opposed to a racer i did, I did sorry just, just having a moment there i didn't actually realize he'd, he'd done that off i think no i don't i don't ever remember hearing anything about it. that's quite yeah that is a very poignant moment and i think kind of a, a poignant note to end on i guess john t really and um yeah thank you for helping me with this one though it's um it's one that we've wanted to do for a while but we thought we'd wait until we got to the anniversary didn't we and it's something we talk about a lot so definitely another thing we have in common i think it's fair to say john t yeah, I mean, this is a very, very different tone to what people are used to. And apologies to anyone watching who it makes sad or people it might surprise, but it's one of those important days that shouldn't be forgotten just because it's unpleasant. I could not agree any more with that. And I think it's a, it's one that we kind of had to do in a podcast because it's you definitely can't approach this tone on a live stream because there's, there's way too much bantering and that that goes on. And I've got way too much respect for what happens that weekend to be to be doing that but yeah it, i think it had to be addressed and you know we, we've talked about doing it for so long and we want people to know what our, our memories are and our thoughts are for that weekend so it was definitely it felt important to do for me anyway so uh yeah but thank you very much for joining me john t it's been it's been great to talk to. it's been a bit morbid and somber like you say but it's nice to be able to just sit and chat about these things with somebody who remembers it as well yeah it really has quite therapeutic and hopefully more people will remember both of them now Definitely. And, and hopefully F1, they didn't do anything in Azerbaijan, but hopefully they'll think about doing something to remember them as well, because it's uh, it's something that needs to be remembered for so many reasons. And hopefully there'll be uh, steps to, to do something. Um, we're off to Donington as well in May, aren't we, John T? So that's going to be a few bits there yeah. that will remind us. Yeah, and that'll be more upbeat. Definitely, yeah. Uh, but thank you very much, mate. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. That is it from us then, of course. I will be back soon with more content, but as ever, thank you for watching and listening. I've been Sean. This has been the F1 Word, and until next time, goodbye.